Hey, we'd like to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Isotope, makers of software and plugins for audio repair, mixing, and mastering. We use Isotope products here at the High Gain. It's an important part of how we've been able to bottle pure podcast gold week after week. And guess what? Isotope offers one free month of Music Production Suite Pro, which has all the tools you need to mix, master, and repair audio. Also, you can get 10% off all other software using the promo code FRET10. That's F-R-E-T-1-0. All of this is at isotope.com, I-Z-O-T-O-P-E dot com. Hey, this is Ed Peterson. And this is John Kiltica. What is this, John? Uh, this is the High Game Podcast. Oh, cool. What do we talk about? Oh, we talk about guitars and everything. Cool. Are you in West Seattle? I am in West Seattle, Ed. Me too. Just a couple blocks away. Are you in the basement? I am hunkered down in the bunker. I am hunkered down in the bunker with my bodyguard spider fighting cat. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You've got that thing going on. Vicky and I have a uh, actual like spider adoption program. When we see spiders in the house, we put them on plants or we put them in a bucket and move them to somewhere where they can actually like make a little web out of the way. And, you know, I don't mind spiders. I like them. Oh, it's different. It's a little different way of looking at it. Because spiders are fine. They eat other bugs. Yeah, that's what they keep saying. <laughs> that's what Big Spider tells you. The military industrial spider <laughs> complex. <laughs> yeah. No, spiders are great. You know what I'm saying? Have you been? I've been pretty good. It's uh, sunny out here today. I know. There was rain this last week, but yeah, it's beautiful today. I might maybe go down to the beach or something a little later. What do you think of that? Crap. Be careful. You know the beach. Yeah. That's where shit goes down. Sure. Yeah. The killer whales are down there. Yeah, you can go down there and just depending on the day, you can catch orca fins popping up out of the water, which is pretty cool. I think that's pretty great. Yeah, but they'll kill you <laughs> just as soon as look at you. Yeah. You know, when I go to the beach, I don't do a lot of swimming in West Seattle in the sound. Yeah, but have you ever seen any of that video where the killer whales and the large sharks will just like dive out of water and yeah right up onto the shore and grab something and go back in yeah i don't know so you're gonna be there saying oh what a lovely day let's walk down by the water's edge mm -hmm. all i'm saying is i'm concerned ed okay well i'm living on the edge i guess <sighs> fine <laughs> The shark babe has such teeth, dear, and he shows them pearly whites. Just a jackknife has so bad teeth, babe, and he keeps it out of sight. Beverages. Beverages, Ed. The shark bite maybe extended your fixation with the shark thing. Yes. I wasn't sure how it was going to wrap back around, but then it wrapped around to Mac the Knife. Yeah. What did you think of that all jazzy style? It's originally a jazzy guy, right? Isn't it? That song was written as part of the Three Penny Opera in 1928, composed by Kurt Vile, lyrics by Bertolt Brecht. I don't really know anything about the Three Penny Opera. But I don't think it means it's an opera. I don't know. Might have been. <laughs> but anyway, Ed. <laughs> yeah. You drinking anything? I'm having a lovely frosty cherry limeade soda. Is that an orca beverage? It is. I went back up and picked up another orca because we're out of our stash. I don't want to think we've been ghosted. No. Carbonated water. Nice. Pure cane sugar. Then you got some, you know, food starches. Food starches? It's uh, frosty, so it's got a little Santa Claus elfy looking dude on it. You know, so it's like kind of a Christmas thing with cherry limeade. What do you think of that? That sounds pretty peppy. Mm-hmm. Pretty fresh, pretty sparkly. Yeah. You know what I have, Ed? Uh, I don't. I have coffee. Oh, just coffee. But... I'll tell you why I have just coffee. Okay. I have a big thermos down here filled with this coffee. Oh, great. This is delicious reanimator coffee. 
Do I know anything about them? Reanimator roasts their own beans over there in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Really? Yes. This coffee was sent to me by superfan Dr. Frank. Yes. And I thought, it may be sunny out, but it's a little chilly, fall style. Mm-hmm. I'm going to just brew up some fancy coffee. That's great. And so I got into the Dr. Frank stash. That's great. And again, thank you, Dr. Frank, for the coffee. Yeah. I have this frosty and a cup of coffee and a banana strawberry blackberry smoothie. I'm not just frosty. I'm not just big orca. Right. I'm mixing it up a little bit. That is good to hear. Yeah. Backup beverages. Always a plus. Turn that thing off. What was that? That was the Bell Epoch Epoch. Mm. Oh, there's some controversy, Ed. Yeah, Epoch and Epoch. Superfan Alex Mm -hmm. would like me to know that he thinks it is epic. And my response was that perhaps both are acceptable. Like maybe if you're British. That feels like a huge cop-out to me. You are a stickler for Tesco, right? I'm not a stickler just because I'm being a fucking stickler. Right. We went to Nam. We talked to Tysco. We asked Tysco what is the correct pronunciation. And the guys at Tysco said Tysco. Exactly. See, this is what I'm saying. You said both could be correct. And all I'm saying is, I bet if we went to Catalan Bread, there's a correct pronunciation. Could it be the same as neither, neither? No. Well, which one's right? Both. And I'm saying that's incorrect. Now I'm going to look it up. The period of French history between 1880 and the outbreak of World War I in 1914. In the U.S. and Canada, most commonly pronounced epoch. Listen to this. Yeah. Epoch. I stand corrected. Epoch. Bell epoch. <laughs> This is why our super fans are so important to us. Right. Because if you came on this show and started saying, oh, I'm having a beverage in an aluminum can, I would blow my fucking gourd. That's right. So we don't want to do that. No. Do you have a cool guitar? I do. This is a premier Bantam. In the case of this particular guitar, it is a Bantam Deluxe. And it is a jazzy jazzer. Yeah. How is this different from the regular jazzy jazzers? The most noticeable thing that any jazz cat is going to notice upon looking at this thing is it's small. Mm Mm-hmm. It's a little guy. Yeah. And that's pretty cool. Uh, It's got two DeArmond style pickups in it. It's got a factory Bigsby on it. Fretboard inlays that are rounded pearl squares. Blocks, but rounded. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Inlay on the headstock of a kind of flower pot looking thing. Maybe a torch. Could be a torch. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating little guitar. It's got a wonderful sound to it. A thing that we don't discuss a ton anymore, like it just occurred to me as I looked at this guitar. Yes. The pole bangers on the pickups are pretty interesting. Yes. There's the six distinct pole bangers on each, but then there's the little screws that are kind of offset and next to them. Yeah, they're spaced in groups of two, two, four, six, and they are adjustable. The screw does not adjust the pole banger. It adjusts the screw, right? That's right. Okay. It's a set neck. Nice and full and round sounding. This was first introduced in 1959. That's the year Bobby Darren took Mac the Knife to number one on the charts. Wrapping it back around. You know how we do. Yeah. One of the more distinctive things on it is the pick guard and the little pickup selector. It's almost like tiger stripey looking or something. It is like tiger stripe tortoise shell. They did a lot of weird stuff with those appointments. The pick guard, the selector switch cover, and the knobs. These are not the original knobs on this one. You could get sparkly glitter, different colored stuff, all different kinds of, what do you call that, bling added to your bantam? Bling it out. <laughs> 
But where does this start, Ed? Premier. I don't think I know anything about Premier as a company. I don't know anything about Premier guitars. So I don't know. Let me go. These guys are in Chicago. I don't know anything about them, but I'm going to say they're Chicago boys. No. Come on. It starts in 1935, Ed. Okay. In the great city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia. You know, there's a place called Reanimator Coffee there. Oh, right. So there was a guy named Lou in Philadelphia. You know, Lou from Philly. Philly Lou. Yeah, Philly Lou. His last name was Sorkin. Okay. Lou Sorkin, he's got a music store in Philadelphia. Okay. He decides, I don't think I want to have a music store anymore, and I don't think I want to be in Philadelphia anymore. <laughs> I think I want to move up in the biz. I want to start my own music distribution empire. I'll have all kinds of stuff I could sell. Yeah. Where's the best place to do this in 1935? New York City, man. Yeah. So Lou packs it up and he goes to the big city. I'm going to go off on this tangent Uh oh. for a second here. A Peterson tangent. Here we go. A thing occurs to me as you're talking to me. This is another one of those dudes who wants to do guitar shit, but he doesn't want to make guitars. He's another one of those guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's the guy who imports everything from Japan early days, and he gets the cut of the import market. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> this is a very similar thing. And I think there's probably others we've talked about where the person doesn't really care about guitars. No. The guy you're describing is a businessman. Yes. You know. I think that might be because he gets to New York and he starts his own company all right. But here's the thing I could not figure out. Our man Lou Sorkin, he starts a company and he calls it the Peter Sorkin Music Company. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out, well, who the fuck is Peter? No clue. <laughs> Lost to history. Huh. Some dead relative, a kid, a father. I don't know. Weird. So that's how that starts, and he's all set up by the 1940s as Sorkin Music. Okay. Now he wants to make amps, so he wants to start another company to make the amps. Now, the Sorkin Music Company, as I mentioned, is a distributor. Okay. But he wants to have an actual manufacturing company, so he starts another company, Ed. Great. He calls it Multivox. Yep. Yeah. They're going to make the amps. Sure. He needs a brand name for these amps. He calls them Premier. Right. I guess he was busy kind of securing the entire... Chain? Yeah. He owns a company that's making the amps and happens to also own the company that is going to distribute the amps. That must be nice. Interesting. Yeah. And Premier amps, you can still find them all over the place. There were tons of them. Yeah. They made an external reverb unit that was one of the first... That's cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Sometimes when you talk, I just do the quick little search and just kind of look at the things as you're talking, just so I can visually get it in my brain. Oh, so did you find some Premier amps? Yeah, yeah. And they're pretty cool. Like, they are very of that era, you know? Like, just the font, and there's a lot of Art Deco-y touches to them Yeah, that I think are pretty cool. They're all very brown, beige tones, kind of in the Tweety world. Yeah, it is weird, isn't it? Like the 40s. Was that just a brown time? <laughs> it was the brown time. <laughs> Honey, where's my brown wool trousers? Hell yeah. Yes, they were doing well with the amps. And in the late 40s, early 50s, our man Lou, a.k.a. Peter, <laughs> right, decides, uh, hey, we should add some guitars to this deal. But the Multivox company only makes amps. They don't know anything about making guitars. Where are we going to have the guitars made then? How about hmm, New Jersey, Ed? <laughs> sure, of course. What year is this? 46 is when they first begin thinking about this. They should have been in Chicago. They go to Jersey City, New Jersey, Ed. You know about Jersey City? Do I know about it? Yeah. Crime? Probably. Mafia? <laughs> Probably. Uh, tons of finance. It's right across the river from lower Manhattan. So much finance that Jersey City is sometimes called Wall Street West. Mm -hmm. But that's boring. The most interesting part is that is the birthplace of Martha Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> that is certainly the most interesting part. And what do I think of when I think of Martha Stewart? Crime. Financial crime? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Insider trading, maybe? Yeah, the irony. 
she's a felon, right? Federal prison felon. Hell yeah, Martha. She goes so hard. Martha? <sighs> Martha goes very hard. Yeah. Teardrop tattoo on her face. Oh, you know it. You know? They cover it up when she's shooting a show or baking a cake or something, but we all know what's under there. Yeah, yeah. 2004, found guilty of felony charges of conspiracy, obstruction of an agency proceeding, and making false statements to federal investigators. Whoa. Jersey girl. <laughs> Hell yeah. Exactly. That is pretty cool. But not as cool, Ed, as the people that Sorkin Music get to make their guitars for them in Jersey City. Okay. I wish they were still here so I could buy a t-shirt. Yeah. Production of their guitars is outsourced to the United Guitar Corporation. That's the coolest company name? I love how industrial that sounds. <laughs> sure. United Guitar Co. Are they still around? I wish. Yeah, me too. Hey, did we, Dong, Lou? Oh. Do we still got... Oh, we lost him. That is, of course, Ed, the 1981 Inventions DRV pedal. It's the only pedal that just, like, stays on every iteration of my board. For sure. Yes. I'm on the mailing list for 1981, and if you go right now, and hopefully it's still the case when this episode drops, there are some 1981s available. I sent a little notification out into the Discord channel, and I think a couple people picked them up. Nice. There's a cool grayscale colorway. That's the first time they've done that one. And then there's their standard white with the blue, yellow, red stripe thing. That's the one we have here at High Gain North. Yeah. Down at High Gain South, you've got the pink one, right? Pink with the white lettering. Yeah. So go buy a 1981 if that's your thing. Used to be I would just uh, turn that thing up to 10 and... <laughs> Now Ed has me trained to have it on the lower setting just to show people what a little bit of dirt on a guitar would sound like. This Premier Bantam Deluxe yeah. is really fun to play. It comes out in 1959, and I mentioned earlier that it's small. It's a little guy. Okay. If you measure across the lower bout, it's only about 13 inches wide. For reference, your big old jazzy jazz boxes yeah. are going to be closer to like 17, 18 inches across. Wow, so it's a lot smaller. It is. It's a lot smaller. One of its selling points was how light it is. This thing only weighs about five pounds. Perfect. In fact, they call it, in their literature of the day, Zephyr Weight. Very cool. Zephyr weight. As light as a zephyr. What the hell's a zephyr? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. A light breeze coming from the west. Is that right? Yes. So then I had to figure out, well, why is that called a zephyr? So I went down that hole and realized that zephyr was the name of a god. Any idea what he was the god of? Light breezy air? Yeah. <laughs> zephyr was the god of the west wind. Oh, cool. Crazy. This is Zephyr weight, this guitar. Five pounds is pretty good for a guitar. Yeah. There's a statement that adds zero value to the show. I love when you add zero value, Ed. <laughs> well, it's kind of my specialty. If you want to guarantee something won't get cut, yeah. add some zero value. Okay. I'll leave it in. This guitar, it was released in 1959. Yes. You know what else was released in 1959? The Mercury 7 rocket really was 1959. Mercury 7 is the name of a pedal by the pedal company Maris. It's all intertwined. Right. What year did Sputnik go up? Because I've got a Sputnik pedal on my board. Oh, that's great. The Sputnik 1 was 1957. Oh, space race. Sputnik 3? 1958. That's some Sputnik. Yeah. I fully support companies releasing guitar pedals with space race naming conventions. I'm very into it. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Spaceman FX, that's their deal. Yeah. You know, and they don't just go U.S. They'll release communist pedals. 
Hell yeah. So, 1959, this thing comes out, and they would make the Bantam and its variants throughout the entire history of the company. So you could get all kinds of different appointments. It seems like from year to year, things were added, taken away, changed, modified. So it's almost not enough to say, oh, I've got a premier Bantam. Well, that could look like anything. That's how kind of varied it was. Huh. Which is kind of cool. Bantam? Yes. It's the name for any small variety of fowl, usually a chicken or a duck. Wow, a bantam chicken. Or, in military terms, it's a soldier shorter than five foot three during the First World War. Oh. Did they have a whole bantam division or something? Like the shorty dudes? Well, there's bantam weight in boxing. Sure, sure, but this was applied to height. It's all coming together. So this is the Bantam. It is Zephyr weight. Oh, so this is like the little chicken rooster guy. Sure. How much, Ed? In $1959 was the premier Bantam. Oh, God. Um, You said this is like a higher end instrument. Very well made, yes. I'm going to say this thing was like $314. Look at you, Ed. Yeah? Look at you. Look at you. <laughs> it was... $335. Whoa! That was no looking up. You know, maybe I had the conversion fairly well kind of in my brain. How does that work with the high gain vintage index? <laughs> Ooh. The high gain vintage index for uh, all the viewers is the today equivalent of $2,000. Right. And I'm going to say this was above that number. And I'm going to say it blew the index away coming in at $2,460? $2,996 today dollars. Hell yeah. Now here's the fucked up part. Yeah? In 1959, that was $10 more than an ES-175 from Gibson. Back then? Back then. A hundred bucks difference in today dollars. High-end, well-made guitars competing with things like that from Gibson. What didn't work? The guy's a businessman, and he's making amps, and he's outsourcing these guitars. Why did it fall apart? That's a really good question. Right about that time, 1960 or so, rock and roll's getting really big. Everybody wants a guitar. Right. So there's that. But who wants a jazzy box? Did they ever break into the solid body game? They did. Oh. Imagine, like, the top horn of a guitar in a curly cue. <laughs> It's not really my thing. It's playing off kind of a classical, fancy kind of vibe to it. The solid bodies were actually made by Multivox. I guess they could trust them with the solid bodies, just not the jazzy boxes. Sure. I don't think any of the Premier guitars achieved any kind of great popularity. But as I say, they are well made and they play wonderfully. This one has gold hardware and a gold Bigsby on it. And they nicknamed it the Golden Blonde. Uh -uh. Mm. But they didn't spell it like golden and blonde. It was gold, the letter N, then blonde. You know, like Toys R Us, Golden Blonde. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. It was a complicated time, Ed. They show up at the NAMM show in 64. Okay. And they're showing their guitars and their amps and all their kind of stuff. And they come across this Japanese guy. Ikutaro Kakahashi. Okay. Great guy, this guy. <laughs> Turns out, Ikutaro. Yeah. Oh. Legendary. Yeah? Yeah. He was there all by himself. He was an inventor, and he had this little box he called the Ace Tone. They had some little push buttons on it. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. That turned out to be the world's first drum machine. Oh, cool. Everybody passed on it, except Sorkin. Our man Lou, a.k.a. Peter, ends up being the exclusive distributor for these little Ace Tone boxes. No kidding. Yeah. You could press the buttons and play it manually, but it also had in-box rhythms. I don't know, like rumba. Press the button, it'll play like a little rumba. Yeah. Our man Ikutaro Kakahashi. Yeah. This guy had a lot going on up in his noggin. He would go on to found Roland. Oh. Oh. 
Yeah. I've heard of that. He was into the effects and stuff. After he founded Roland, he decided to found Boss. Jeez. So imagine, you know, a young Ikutaro in 1964. Nobody's interested in his drum machine except our man Lou, a.k.a. Peter Shorkin. Very cool. Lou, a.k.a. Peter, maybe he didn't play, maybe he did, but apparently he was interested in trying new stuff. Yeah, that's super interesting because he didn't hold on to this guy who then went on to found Roland and Boss. He was literally at the ground floor of the drum machine thing, and then the guy left and went and did it somewhere else. Right. So had an eye for this is cool and interesting and we should work together, and then didn't. Also, Sorkin, in 1964, becomes the sole importer of Hofner basses. Yeah. He's tangentially connected to all kinds of cool shit. <laughs> like, had an eye for the talent, just not how to capitalize on it or whatever. Weird. Well, they did well enough anyway because he was able to sell it in 1973. Oh, okay. Currently, some company called the Entertainment Music Marketing Corporation <laughs> owns the rights to the premiere name. Cool. So what do you think of that, Ed? Little tiny builder that not a lot of people have heard about. They just never really reached the heights and just sort of faded from memory. And I wonder how many brands like that there were. There are any number of really cool boutique manufacturers that we follow today that are making super high quality, amazing instruments, forward thinking design, all of that stuff, like a one by one in a garage. Plenty of those companies will just continue in a garage for some number of years and then that will be it. But I think in 30 years from now, someone will come across one of those guitars. And if you dig into it and you look back, it's like, oh, there was a guy who really cared about the guitar. Right. You got some cats going on over there. What's going on with those cats? This is Howard, our geriatric cat. Yeah. He's an old guy. Yeah. Meanwhile, if you know anything about these premier guitars that we don't, we've got the Discord channel now. Yeah, get in there. It's actually, like, surprisingly active. <laughs> you know? I guess I didn't know what to expect when we launched it. Well, that cat. <laughs> Poor Howard. <laughs> what do you think of that, Ed? Hell yeah. You could send us a mail at thehighgainpod at gmail.com. We love the mails. Maybe one of these upcoming episodes, we should do a mailbag and go through that stuff on air. Gather them up and read them? Yeah. Other than that, all the socials. Yeah. Go to the socials and, you know, be social. Sure. I think we're supposed to say, leave a review on iTunes. Are we? Leave a review on iTunes. Supposedly that helps us. Oh, you know what? I noticed that there was a new review a couple of few weeks back. Yeah. Uh, that was like three or four words, like the person had started to type and didn't finish <laughs> it, but then submitted it. That was kind of funny. Oh, here it is. Oh. If it wasn't for fellow Seattleites, John. <laughs> that's it. Nice. <laughs> no ellipses. Yes. No. That's the review. <laughs> Whoever you are that started that, you know, we'd love for you to finish it. That would be cool. I like it. It's nice and succinct. <laughs> I didn't read the whole thing. There is a title. Oh. The title is, They Will Make Your Mom, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and there's Howard. Okay, then. <laughs> good work, John. Yeah, good work, Ed. That was lots of fun. Solid. Yeah, let's do it again next week. Okay, cool. All right. Bye. Bye.